In Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verses 32 through 39, but call to remembrance the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great fight of afflictions, partly while you were made a gazing stock both by reproaches and afflictions and partly while you became companions of those who were so used, for you had compassion of me in my bonds and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that you have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. Cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For you have need of patience, that after you've done the will of God, you might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. I want to say that one more time. It always has been now, but now the just shall live by faith. It's the same language that comes to us from Habakkuk and also from Romans. The just shall live by faith, and if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. I like to read this verse like this for this time, but we are not of those who draw back, but of those who believe. We are not of those who draw back, but those that believe. I asked our staff in a staff meeting this past week, what do you believe the Lord's looking for on the earth today? And uh, only someone that overlooked my notes over my shoulder saw knew the answer to that. But we had some answers like this. Obedience, and that's important. Love, hey, you know, love's, so, so important. Character, can't do without it. Accuracy, we need more of it. Longevity, God, let it be. Compassion, Lord knows we need compassion. Relationship, yes, we need to know more about relationships and be a part of that. Faithfulness, oh, that's such an awesome word. A faithful man or a woman, who can find? But when God finds one, they will be blessed abundantly. Righteousness, we need a lot of righteousness in our land today. Excellence, faith in God's Word. Well, what about prayer? I mean, the Bible's filled with prayer. That's so important. Oh, yes, that's important. Well, it's revival. The Lord's looking for revival. Our thankfulness, a spirit of thankfulness, and every one of these answers are good. Every one of these answers are good, but I had to go back to Luke, the 18th chapter, and remind all of us, my own heart included, that when Jesus comes, he said, will there be faith? Will the Son of Man find faith? And I want to work on something that really, I suppose, began in my heart in this auditorium last Sunday morning, and I've not been able to get away from it. As we look into the Hebrew letters here in the 10th chapter, but call to remembrance the former days. God wants us to remember some things. God wants you to remember where you were and how you were when Jesus first came into your life. Where you were and how you were. What was the situation of your life? Now, not everyone has a big, bad testimony about who they were and where they were. That's not what I'm after. I'm just saying, do you remember where you were and how it was when Jesus came into your life? And you became another fanatic, born again, excited. Some of you were willing to, in fact, Paul said the same thing. Some of you were willing to sell everything you had. Some of you gave away everything you had. Some of you were willing to leave every friendship that you had had for years because those friendships were totally adverse to this newfound faith that had come into your life. doesn't mean we have to turn our back on everything, but sometimes you do have to make those decisions. Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead. That's a strong one. How was it when Jesus came into your heart? Was it just another religious experience? Was it just another sometime happening in your life? Or was it like a 
explosion of righteousness inside of you that you are willing as the person who found the field that contained the pearl of great price or the treasure to sell everything you had if you had to. And has it been worth it? Think about it. Has it been worth it to walk away from some of the things that some of you walked away from? Has it been worth it to make the commitments that some of you have made? I'm not going to dwell there, but Paul was talking to people that their commitment, some of these very people that Paul was writing to, their commitment cost them their life. Their commitment cost them their fortunes. It's as it was in the early days of America. So many of those who signed the Declaration of Independence that it literally cost them everything they had to be part of a nation that's enjoying what we're enjoying today. So how was it? How was it when Jesus first came into your life? Where were you? How was it? Can you still think back? I can still look back at 3 o'clock in the morning coming in from East Texas when I went to sleep at the wheel and that car went totally out of control at a very high rate of speed. And when it all settled down, the only thing I had time to do was just say, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And I wasn't even right with him, but he heard that. God does some business on credit. Can you say amen? It's all I could do. I didn't have time to pray one of these great New Testament prayers. All I could say was, Jesus, 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 as I was awakened to the terrible sounds of an automobile out of control and the grinding and the, all that goes with it. I can still think back to that night and I say, thank God, God spared my life. That could have been it. All over America, it was it for someone this last week. Maybe crossing a street, maybe driving a car. Person said the other day, I was just minding my business, driving at a very safe rate of speed. And a big truck ran a stop sign and, and their life has been changed. I think we need to look back and remember where we were and how we were when Jesus first came into our life. And it might not have been that dramatic at that time, but think what a change Jesus has brought into your life. What a wonderful change has come into your life. Call to remembrance the former days in which after you were illuminated, when Jesus came into your heart, you were willing to sell anything, to do anything, to endure anything just to hold to the nail-scarred hand of Jesus. In fact, he said, you took joyfully the spoiling of your goods. My, my. Then in verse 5, he said, cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. Don't cast away your confidence. Oh, it has great recompense of reward. Implying that there are many believers who have and who will cast away their confidence. You know, your confidence is what keeps you going. I read with great interest. I'm, I'm not an avid golfer. I, it'd be nice if I was, but that's just not my, one of my great talents. But I was reading in the paper here just a few days ago, Tom Watson, 48 years of age, he, old timer. It kind of hurt my feelings. Old timer. He's the second oldest man to ever win out at Colonial. Ben Hogan was the only other man, 48 or over, that ever won out there at that particular age. Over the hill at 48. <laughs> well, let's move right along here. I don't want to stay there. <laughs> and do you realize that that man for 21 years had played Colonial? 21 years. 21 years. Now, that would be very discouraging to me to play for 21 years and never win. Oh, he placed and he made money and that was his living. But something I read, I'm always looking for that little, the story behind the story. I'm always looking for that little nugget that maybe someone else didn't just quite see it. And as I was reading, I stopped and I backed up and I read again. He said, you know, when they first started, others were leading and other things were happening. But he said there was a point, there was a point, there was a time when something in me, he said, there, I'm going to say it, there was an inward knowing. And here's exactly what the man said, if I can keep the ball out of the Trinity River, I can win. If I can just keep the ball out of the Trinity River, I believe I can win. He felt it in his bones. The confidence was there. 
something inside of him said, after 21 times of going for it, 22 is going to be your time to win. Oh, I'm looking out at some of you that could say, Brother Nichols, I can relate to that. You don't know how many times I've tried and failed. But you know, the good thing about the kingdom of God, even when you fail, it's not all over. Because the first report's not the last report. And I've got another line to that. The last report's not the last report. When your faith is in God. Somewhere along the line, there was a confidence that began to build in that golfer. And he said, I, I believe I can do it. I believe I can do it. I believe I can do it. You know, every time I come to this pulpit to preach, I, by the grace of God, cry out to God for that same inspiration to come to your heart, to come to your marriage, to come to your business, to come to a husband or to a wife. I pray, God, that that same nugget of inspiration will be released in this house, that you'll leave this place saying, today something happened. I know I can make it. I have confidence. I'm not here to destroy your confidence. I'm here to build your confidence. I'm not here to destroy your faith. I'm here to build your faith in God by the grace of God. You have need of confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. You say, how important is my confidence? It's the difference in winning. I said it's the difference in victory. It's the difference in winning. For you have need of patience. For you have need of patience. That after you've done the will of God, you might receive the promise. Well, I thought all you did was just believe it and then it happened. No, you have need of patience. 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 You have need of patience. You have need of patience. You believe the right thing. You prayed the right thing. You've done the right thing. Now you have need of patience that you might receive the promise. It's worth it. It's worth it. According to the word, it's worth it. I heard a funny story. I don't know if it's real or if, I don't know what, but uh, I'll just tell it to you anyway. They said there was a man that was doing so terrible in his golf game while we're on golf stories. Doing so terrible in his golf game, finally about midway through, there was a lake there, and he just stopped and got his clubs and the whole thing, just threw it in the, in the water. Just threw them in a little river there. Everybody just was shocked. Threw a brand new set of clubs and all, just threw them away and walked off the golf course. After a while, they saw him coming back, and his head was down. He looked kind of repentant. They thought, well, he's had a change of heart. Fished his golf clubs out, unzipped a little compartment, took his car keys out, threw the clubs back in. And I guess he went home. I don't know where he went. You know what happened to that golfer? He lost his confidence. You know what happens to a lot of believers? They lose their confidence. Demas lost his confidence. And Paul said, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Judas lost his confidence. Judas said, I better get all I can can and can, all I can get. This thing looks like it's going down to me. He's talking about a cross. Judas lost his confidence. Achan lost his confidence. He said, you know, God's word's not good enough. I better stash something away from me. I don't care what God says. I'm going to do it my way. And it cost Achan his life and the life of his family. I'm telling you something, folks. Your confidence has great recompense of reward. You don't quit on your first day and you don't quit on your worst day. We're not of those who draw back unto perdition. I'm reaching out to build some confidence this morning. Some of you are just that far away from receiving the promise. Just that far away. You're on the threshold. The angel's on the way. I believe there's a warehouse in heaven for packages that were almost delivered. But somebody lost their confidence. Somebody lost their patience. Some of you are just that far away from receiving I mean, that leaped out of my spirit, that leaped out of my spirit. You have need of confidence after you've done the right thing and given the right thing and believed the right thing and said yes and no to the right thing. 
that you might receive the promise. Oh, yes. The Word of God said in verse 38, Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. You know, we're raising a generation of quitters. In Orange County, 90% of marriages end in divorce. Somebody's not getting the message of don't quit. It's bad enough 50% in any average community nowadays. You know, we're raising a generation of quitters. I mean, we quit. I've had stories of quit come to me the last 30 days that make an angel weep. I mean, just foolish stories, silly stories, stories that don't make sense. People that are that close to it, and they quit. I remember reading a motivational story a number of years ago about a man who for years pursued a rich vein of gold and finally out of utter frustration sold the whole thing for just pennies on the dollar and the next man that came in 36 inches from where he quit struck one of the richest gold veins that had ever been discovered. Are you following me? That's a, that's a true story. One man lost his confidence. One man said, years of investment mean nothing to me. Someone else can just have it for pennies. And the person that believed in it was the person that got the prize. Now, isn't that strange? Here, this dear man works for years, spends his money, does all you can do, and walks away from it, and a man comes up and has confidence in what the other man doesn't have confidence in, and he wins. Very strange, isn't it? Oh, I tell you, there's 11th hour workers that are coming on the job. There's 11th hour believers that are coming into the kingdom of God. Watch it, watch it. Don't give your inheritance away. Don't give your faith away. Don't give the blessings of God in your life away. And we were raising a generation of quitters. We quit on God. We quit on church. We quit on ties. We quit on marriage. We quit on this. We quit on that. I don't know. They're just something that's you know, something I figured out years ago, you don't have to be the smartest, you don't have to be the brightest, you don't have to be the most articulate. Just hear from God and by the faith of God refuse to quit and watch what God will do in your behalf. Don't quit. Don't quit. If you've heard from God, don't quit. If you've heard from God, whew, don't quit. So the Word of God said, the just shall live by faith. And then let me just finish reading this because it's so rich to my spirit. The just shall live by faith, and if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. didn't say God did not love you. It just said that there wasn't anything there that God could have pleasure in. But we are not of those who draw back, not of them who draw back but of those that believe. We are not of those that draw back, but of those that believe. I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, we're not of those that draw back. We're not of those that draw back. We are not of those that draw back. Now with that in mind, I want to go right to the heart of the matter. I want to go right to the heart of the matter. Now I want you to listen to Pastor Bob Nichols as you've never listened before. You know, a lot of people have quit on revival. A lot of people have quit on prayer. A lot of people have quit on tithing. A lot of people have quit doing what's right. So what's this all about? You know what Satan's after? I've already given you the, the punchline. Obedience, all these things were important, and I wrote them down, and our staff did a wonderful job, and I've preached on every one of these. Obedience and love and character and accuracy and longevity and relationship and faithfulness and righteousness and excellence and prayer and revival and all of this. Let me tell you what Satan's after. Satan's after your faith. Satan's after your faith because everything that comes from God is built on faith. Everything. Everything. You can't love like you ought to love unless it's built on faith. You can't, even your giving must be mixed with faith. Please listen to me. Your tithing, do it in faith. Some people pray, but they look like a sour persimmon. God wants you to pray in faith. Why, there was a man that uh, two or three years ago that fasted. He said he was going to fast until a certain thing happened. He died. 
You say, did God let him die? No, he killed himself. God didn't tell him to do that. He wasn't even a believer anyway, but he was going to fast until all the hunger of the world was alleviated. I thought he was a real sharp guy. At least he used to be. <laughs> Let me go to a basic here. Satan's after your faith. He's after churches of faith. He's after ministers of faith. If he could stop your faith, he could stop television. If he could stop your faith, he could stop radio or whatever you're doing. If he could stop your faith, he could stop revival. If he could stop your, if he could stop, if, 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 but he can't do it, he can't do it, can't do it, can't do it, can't do it. Can't do it unless you let him do it. First of all, I want you to write down God is a faith God. God's a faith God. Everything God ever said, it happened. If God ceased to be a faith God, he would self-destruct because his word would no longer be valid. God is a faith God. And because we produce after like kind, when God created Adam and Eve, he created them to be faith people. This just came to me the last few days. I mean, just it just, I should have seen it a long time ago. Did you know, you talk about getting a word from God, Adam and Eve got a fresh word from God every day. I mean, there's a few days go by sometimes, no rockets really fire in my spirit. Every day, Adam and Eve got a word from God. Every day in the cool of the evening, they knew where he would come, they knew when he would come, God would come in the cool of the evening, and God had a word for that evening and a word for the day to come. And you know all Adam and Eve had to do was just to do what God told them last. That's all they had to do. And God said, there's only one thing in the garden that you're not to touch. Let's let it be this. He said, don't touch that tree. Don't touch the tree. You live in paradise. No mortgage payments, no car payments, no hassles. I mean, no utilities. No hassles. You just wake up in the morning and just say, here we go again. The temperature was perfect. No thermostats. Wasn't too cool. Wasn't too hot. God said, the only thing you get, don't touch one thing. Now, that's the ne only, only word that God gave them. And God had a purpose in that because God did not want this beautiful paradise to be taken from them. And anything God tells you not to do, God tells you that so that you'll not lose the wonderful things that God's doing in your life. Hey, God has this thing figured out. God is not calculating how he can rip you off. God's calculated how he can bless you. Blessing is on the mind of God. See how many times blessing is in the scriptures. Blessed is the man that walketh not according to the counsel of the ungodly and standeth in the way of sinners and are sitteth in the sea of the scornful. Don't do one thing. Well, you parents are already ahead of me. You can give a child the run of the house and say, don't do one thing. And it may be while you're there or while you're not looking, there's got to be a touch. And boy, was it a costly touch. Was it a costly touch. And Adam and Eve committed high treason. You know what? Listen, the big deal was they stopped believing the Word of God and started believing the Word of Satan. Simple analogy. They stopped believing the Word of God and they started believing the Word of Satan. Was that important? You better know it's important. Adam and Eve committed high treason and they began to work by the sweat of their brow and civilization began to go downhill from that point on. And then we come up to a man by the name of Noah. Things had so deteriorated until they got to the time of Noah that Noah was the only righteous man that God could communicate with on the face of the earth. And God said, build an ark to the saving of your house. And any preacher could sympathize with Noah. Anyone that's in a building program for 120 years, God help them. God help anybody that's in a building program for 120 years. And every day, you know what Noah did? Noah was saved because he just kept obeying God's word. Just kept doing what God told him last. The ark was ugly. Everybody laughed at the ark. No one understood it. They thought he was crazy. Noah was the craziest man in the world until it started to rain. 
and until the waters begin to rise and watch it, the, it's beginning to rain and the waters are beginning to rise. And that ark of faith that God's talked to you about building is going to be the salvation of you and your house. Then they got off the boat. You'd think Noah would never, this Hebrews 11 faith man, all he did was hear what God said and by faith he obeyed and he didn't quit and he saved his entire family. We're getting closer to the heart of the matter. Did you know if the whole sum total of your life was that you saved your family, that it's been a good life? I know of preachers that have saved the world, but they lost their family. That's a terrible trade-out. God says, why not both? And I salute the field ministries of this church, your love for your children and your faith for them. Let me tell you something. We can win the world and lose our own. It's a terrible, terrible trade-out. He saved his family. Noah saved his family. By the grace of God, he saved his family. But then he got out of the ark, and man goes back to same old, same old. And then there was a faith couple by the name of Abraham and Sarah. And God came to Abraham. This thing reads too easy. It really reads too easy. You know all of this, and, and some of us still don't do it. We've been taught it for years. We see the fruits of it. We know the scriptural validity of it. Here's Abraham just out in the middle of <laughs> heathenism, and God comes and reveals himself and said, Abraham, I've come to cut covenant with you, and if you'll just obey what I'm asking you to do, he said, can you count the stars in the sky? Can you count the sands in the seashore? He said, so shall your descendants be. All you have to do is do what I ask you to do. All you have to do is do what I ask you to do. Don't do what I say don't do and do what I ask you to do. Simple. And was Abraham and Sarah perfect? No. But I have a word of hope for us. God doesn't just for the rest of our life judge us on the performance of one specific thing. God sees the longevity of our life. Aren't you glad that God didn't judge you on your worst moment? Aren't you glad that God didn't just cancel his whole plan because of one moment or one situation of failure or you didn't respond as you should have? Abraham and Sarah had some failures, but overall they just kept doing what God told them last. And then we go on to this thing and then finally man said, we don't like God's system. We want a king. And God said, okay, if I give you a king, you're going to have the consequences of a king. And so God gave them a king, and Saul started out wonderful, but then it was all, it all went another direction. And then there was David, and as wonderful as David was, and David was a man of faith, but there were failures in his life. And in every king, there, was, there were failures. And finally, this thing degenerated down. Hey, the happy part's coming. Just hold on. This thing degenerated down to where there was 400 years of silence. God had been trying to say something. You parents ever get tired of trying to say something and people won't let, you know, kids won't listen to you? Huh? How do you think God feels? How do you think God feels? I mean, God is saying everything a God can say, promising everything a God can promise, giving everything that a God can give, and, and everybody just whistling, going down the road, not giving God the time of day. And finally, there was 400 years of silence. Now man's trying to hear, but. God's not talking. It's scary when God doesn't talk. 400 years of silence. Oh, folks, there's a powerful truth that's winding and unwinding through what I'm saying here today. The star began to shine. And a John the Baptist began to preach. You know, all John did was do what God told him to do. That's all he did. Strange guy. <laughs> kind of weird. But he obeyed God. He obeyed God. John the Baptist came on the scene. And then, thank God, going way back, star began to shine. And there were the shepherds and the wise men and all of that. And thank God, unto us a son is born. Unto us a Savior is given. And his name is Jesus. When God sent his only begotten son to this world, he sent a faith son. He sent a faith son. Jesus caught the vision. He said, I do always those things that please the Father. He said, I obey the Father. I don't do anything that the Father hasn't told me to do. Jesus caught the vision of obedience and faith. And thank God, he walked before his Father God. 
And then they put him on the cross. And then I see that, that Peter, even before that time, Peter caught the revelation of this faith walk. Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter caught that vision, though he didn't walk in it perfectly. And later on, Paul caught that vision. And Paul said, In him we move and we live and we have our being. There's only one. His name is Jesus. There's only one. As you go through the Bible, God's always had his great hearts. God's always had his men and women of faith. And then he's always had the lesser lights. But as I read this just a few days ago, in fact, it really started last Sunday morning while I was preaching. Something exploded in my heart. Now the just shall live by faith. You see what the devil is after? He's after your faith. He's after your faith. And the thing that God began to speak to my heart today, what are you going to leave your children? Well, Brother Nichols, we've, we've given them a good education. That's wonderful. That's part of it. Well, Brother Nichols, if... All things are equal. We may leave them a nice little inheritance. That's good. That's wonderful. Well, we're going to leave them a good automobile or some money or whatever. That's good. That's okay. I'm not knocking any of that. Listen to me carefully. I mean, I could tell you six stories right now of the last six months of things that have come to me. People that had good sums of money that came to them, the money's gone today, and they're in worse shape than when the money came. Because if you don't have character and if you don't have integrity and if you don't have wisdom, then it's, it slips right through your fingers. I'll tell you something. The most important thing you can give your son is faith in God. The most important thing you can give your son is, son, this Bible is real. God is real. You may see a professing Christian that is not what they ought to be. You may see a man or a woman who is not what they should be. Someone may promise you something and not keep their word. You will see glitches in the kingdom of God, but son, God will never forsake you. Keep your eyes on Jesus, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. I'm after something this morning. What are we leaving our children? I'm asking myself that question. What are we leaving our children? You may leave them penniless, but if you leave them faith in God's eternal word, they can take that Bible and accomplish anything that God called them to accomplish. When the Son of Man cometh, will he find faith on the earth? And I've been thinking about these things, looking back, one of the greatest needs today. You know, the Bible said that, that unrighteousness will go to two or three, maybe four generations but that righteousness will go to a thousand generations. There's not one of us, there's not one family in this room that is represented that your family, mine or yours, is perfect. As wonderful as they are, there's one, maybe two, maybe more than that, things that you don't need to emulate from your parents. Thank God for the good, thank God for the positive, but there's some things, there's some junk we all have to leave behind. We respect them. It doesn't mean that we do not respect them. That's not what I'm saying at all. I pray to God that my children and my grandchildren are much stronger and much fuller of faith and more gallant in the things of God than I ever thought about being. But what are we leaving? What kind of a legacy are we leaving? What are we leaving behind? Are we just a church just holding services? Are we just the latest this or the latest that? Are we planting something inside of you? Are you just coming to hear Pastor Bob Nichols and all the others that minister? Are you just coming to hear whatever's happening? Or is something being deposited in your spirit? Something of faith and hope and love and courage. Is something being imparted unto you that when the devil offers you the very best he has, that you look at it and say, that's garbage in comparison to the reward and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Governor of this state said in his generation, if it feels good, do it, was the theme. And he said, our nation has suffered in a, some graduation just in the last few hours. He said, the theme of my generation was, if it feels good, do it. And that's prevailing all across the land. Where is a man that cannot be bought? Where is the woman that will not give of her virtue? Where is the businessman that will do the right thing? Where is the preacher who will not sell out cheap? Where is the couple who say we will be true to each other? Where is the family that dares to stay together? 
God's raising up a faith generation. I don't know what that word means to you, but I'm talking about believing that God said what he meant and meant what he said. Faith is believing that God in his word said the right thing the first time. Faith is believing God's word concerning my life and fear is believing the devil's word concerning my life. Let's say that one more time. Faith is believing what God said about me and mine and fear is believing what the devil said about me and mine. Forgive me, I just like oversimplified things. We're too complicated as it is. What kind of a legacy are we leaving? Anything goes, lie, cheat, steal, adultery, fornication, dope, liquor, steal. What kind of a legacy are we leaving? What are we leaving? I'm not asking you what has been. We've got to change what has been, and it's got to start with somebody. And by the grace of God, I'm saying it's starting with us. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Doesn't make any difference what any other person does or preacher does or church does or businessman does. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We'll tell the truth. We'll do the right thing. We'll keep the right attitude. We refuse to walk in unforgiveness. I've seen families that perpetuated unforgiveness and bitterness in the hearts of their children and a preacher couldn't touch them with a 10-foot pole. The parents got over it, but the kids never got over it. Let me tell you something. If there's something you see wrong in the church, for God's sake, for your sake, and for your family's sake, don't sit around and mouth that and chew that and espouse that. Don't sow poison and bitterness in the lives of your children. Then they won't believe the youth minister. They won't believe the pastor. They won't believe anybody for the rest of their life. If something's wrong, pray about it. Commit it to God. Church is not built on perfect people. It's built on people who cry out to the perfect one. And say, help us, Lord. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? What are we imparting? I'll tell you, there's something more important than giving your children a good education, and that's very important nowadays. Something more important than giving them a car when they graduate or when they're in high school. That's nice. That's wonderful. But that's not the most important thing. There's something more important than providing designer clothes for them. And status is a very important thing. And I could go on and on. There's something more important than leaving an inheritance. There's something more important than leaving some acreage or leaving a house. Or if I, if you, if we can just plant those seeds of faith in God. Plant those seeds of faith in God. Things come and things go. But your faith will see you through. Things can slip through your fingers and mean absolutely nothing. But oh, faith in God will see you through. Faith in God will bring you out. Faith in God will raise you up. Faith in God will give you character. Faith in God will give you that ability to not quit when the going gets tough. I'm telling you, we're raising a generation of quitters. I don't really understand the game of hockey. I just understand it's high energy and exciting, but I admire those guys. Man, they don't quit. I mean, it's in your face all the way. And I'll tell you, if we could catch that hockey spirit that they seem to have, and when we get a hold of a promise of God, Satan's not going to have the hockey puck of the promise that God's given me. I'll fight for it. If he makes a goal, he'll do it over my bruised body. And if he makes a goal, I'll be back to make the next one. I've traveled on a number of different occasions and seen hockey teams. I don't even know who they were. Now I can spot them. I used to think somebody had been out drinking in a bar room all night until one or two. You just see that look. They just got a look about them. And one day I said, well, what have you guys been doing? They said, we're hockey players. And said, we had an in-your-face one last night. And I mean, my neighbor There was blood and there was stitches on one or two and I mean, it was something else. But you know, they weren't complaining about it. They said it was something else. They said we did not back off. We gave it everything we had. And I said, oh God, raise up some Christians just like that. We may come out a little bruised. We may come out a little bloody. We may cut them out with a few stitches. 
We may come out with a few wounds, but by the grace of God, we did not quit. We're not going to quit on God. We're not going to quit on the promises of God. We're not going to quit on the covenant of God. We're not going to quit. I believe we're communicating this morning. I see communication all over this room. Oh, I'm after something. I'm after, I'm after any lie of Satan in you that you can't see what God said you can see and you can't do what God said you can do. We're not of those that draw back. We're of those that believe. And how long are we going to believe? We're going to believe until we see it. the son of man comes, is he going to find faith in the earth? I'm going to say by the grace of God, listen to me very carefully, I'm going to say by the grace of God, when he comes, he's going to find faith in Pastor Bob Nichols. When he comes, he's going to find faith in my wife, Joy. He's going to find faith in my children, Susan and Janet. He's going to find faith in my grandchildren. He's going to find faith if Jesus tarries long enough in their children. He's going to find faith in the staff that works with me. He's going to find faith. You know what I appreciate about this staff? I mean, we not only have people of character and integrity, but I thank God for the marriages of this staff. We have some wonderful people here. And I'm not talking about personalities. I'm talking about faith. I'm talking about faith. I'm talking about strength of faith and strength of character. Strength where it really counts and where it really matters. You know, I was just thinking about uh, the promise of the day of Pentecost. I'm, I'm going to preach that one of these. I just got to thinking about before Pentecost ever came. I mean, I get all excited from Pentecost. No, but I just think, you know, failures begin to, <laughs> to practice a pathway of faith. I mean, before the promise was even poured out, just the promise, just believing the promise. Dysfunctional, discouraged men and women turned to God. 120 people left families, jobs, vacation, sick leave schedules to go to the upper room and tarry until. Powerless people began to pray. Gifted organizers found out that <laughs> what they couldn't work out, God could do. Hallelujah. People prayed until. Scattered people became unified in one mind and one accord. Oh, just the power of the promise. And then the promise came. What I want to share with you this morning, the most, you know what's the most important thing in your life is your faith. Hold on to that shield of faith. Above all, taking the shield of faith. I said above all, taking the shield of faith. Now, when you say faith, some people immediately equate things. No, I'm just talking about whatever it means. Faith is what gets you out of bed in the morning. Faith is what keeps you going when everyone else is quitting. Faith is what gives you energy. Faith is your strength. Faith is your vision. Faith is your dream. Faith is what makes you tick. Faith in God. Oh, hallelujah. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith by the grace of God? He's going to find faith in me because I'm not going to quit. The greatest desire I have for my grandchildren is that they have character and integrity and live for God for all the days of their life. But I'm telling you, there's faith in this room today. There's faith in this room today. Thank God the just shall live by faith. I said the just shall live by faith. We're not going to live by feelings. We're not going to live by circumstances. We're not going to live by this or by that. The just shall live by faith. 